Right, right. I, uh, I, I, I agree. It's a nice way to uh, be able to share information during these, mm -hmm. again, unprecedented times. Mm -hmm. So should I, should we, is, should I just, should I get a text from Matthew to say we're going or? Yeah, call him. Okay, wait. 6.30. We're live. Are we live? Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to The Garage. My name is Andrew Bacon with Whistler Live, and uh, we thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, today, we're going to be having a wonderful discussion, actually, uh, with Greg McDonnell, a registered clinical counselor here in Whistler. For those of you who don't know Greg, and that's probably not very many of you, um, today's talk is part of a series called Understanding the Adolescent Brain. Now, I've got four children of my own, and I know understanding the adolescent brain is going to take a lot more than the 40 minutes that we're going to do today, but we're going to, we're going to be talking specifically about helping children cope uh, during COVID-19, uh, during and, and after. Uh, so uh, on behalf of Whistler Secondary School, Myrtle Phillips, and Spring Creek, um, they've invited Greg into your homes today. And uh, from Whistler Life's perspective, we're happy to broadcast that. So I'm gonna turn things over to Greg. Before I do, uh, for those of you watching at home right now, I hope that you're able to uh, share this link. It is whistlerlive.ca. So if there's other parents, friends of yours who might benefit from this, uh, please send them the link, whistlerlive.ca, or they can watch it on Facebook, which is facebook.com slash whistlerlivestream. Throughout this, talk today, you're going to be reaching out to, to a, a lot of folks here in Whistler, and uh, Greg, uh, hopefully you're going to be uh, answering some questions as we go through, but if you're watching and you have a question pertaining to something that Greg is talking about, please put the, in the comments the question, and uh, we're going to try to re relay those questions to Greg uh, during the talk, and uh, we'll get to a few questions afterwards. So, uh, how are you feeling today? I'm all right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. It's great to have you here. We are six feet away from each other. Um, there we go. Yes. Uh, we are six feet away from each other. There are three people involved in this production. Uh, actually, four. One is at a, another location, uh, making sure that the signal is going through to YouTube and to you guys on Facebook. Um, Glenn Mishaw is behind us. He's going to be taking some questions off of the internet, and I'm going to be joining him in just a few seconds, and we're going to turn things over to Greg. Uh, so share, and by all means, ask some questions. This is going to be a very informative session, very timely and uh, very necessary. So we thank you for being here, Greg. And ladies and gentlemen, let me turn you over to Greg McDonnell. Well, thanks, Andrew, and to Whistler Live for having me. I'd like to start by just acknowledging um, this live stream is happening on the unceded territory of the Squamish Lowat nations. I'd also like to uh, build off what Andrew was saying about really acknowledging the work that Claire Hanbury, Lisa Smart, Jeff Maynard, and Stuart Bent, uh, along with all of the SCR, uh, this, um, School District 48, has, uh, has done to make this happen. And really would like to, to thank Whistler Live uh, for hosting us in hopes of providing uh, quick uh, community content right now and um, and I think what you're doing is really innovative and I think with COVID we're all having to uh, pivot our realities a little bit and some of these new skill sets that we're we're trying on for size are are going to be core competencies so uh, I like what you guys are doing and uh, I'm happy to be here uh, as part of that I also want to acknowledge how uncomfortable I feel right now that there's I don't know the world watching on YouTube or Facebook uh, and I'm way outside my, my comfort zone. Uh, something a friend told me that this was my FFT. And if you don't know what an FFT is, look up for uh, look up Renee Brown and, and she'll let you know. But yeah, this is my FFT doing this and I'm outside my comfort zone. And, and you know, Andrew was sort of mentioning that, um, you know, we have an expert here tonight. I have some knowledge, I have some expertise, but I also want to really acknowledge the expertise that you have as parents, intuitive knowledge that you have as parents to take care of your kids. Um, it kind of comes quite naturally in our DNA to do that. And, 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 and so I really want to highlight that tonight. 
Another reason why I think maybe I'm outside of my comfort zone a little bit is, is I may say something tonight that you don't agree with or that's outside your value system. And that's okay. You know, I'm going to put my heart on my sleeve perhaps a little bit tonight and share some anecdotes, uh, some of my own experiences and some of what, what science is sort of urging us around raising kids. And I might not get everything right, um, but, you know, I'm going to do my best to communicate some insights. Andrew might chime in with some questions. I'd really like you all to chime in with some questions as well, um, because we'll, we'll try to address those as we go along, as well as uh, towards the, the end of the evening. And this is going to be short, 30, 40 minutes. We're going to hit some wave caps of some things um, um, and then try to hit some questions and, and then get back to doing the best we can managing. All right. Um, so one of the sort of personal orientations I need you to know about me is that I have a, a personal philosophical orientation to life uh, whereby I kind of follow some stoic philosophies. And I don't mean stoic as in um, show, you know, showing no emotions. I mean more uh, stoicism like those third century BC philosophers that had a bunch of insights about feeling joy, but also not being overwhelmed by emotions when they come up. And I think that's really important. And I have a little story that, that to highlight that, um, that um, I'm hoping Matthew can, can drop a link into a really neat podcast that I listened to recently uh, from the Happiness Lab. Dr. Lori Santos interviewed Bill Irvine, who has this lovely book out called The Stoic Challenge, A Philosopher's Guide to Becoming Tougher, Calmer, and More Resilient. It's a fabulous book, um, and it's a fa fabulous podcast, and I really hope you check it out. But this anecdote I'm going to share with you, I don't think I would have reacted so uh, chilled if I didn't just listen to this podcast. I locked my keys in the car, and uh, I've got a lot going on, like, like you guys. And... Uh, um, so my immediate sort of thought, and I think if you don't capture this in about five seconds, your rational brain is lost and you become overwhelmed by, um, um, you know, the, uh, activation in your nervous system Then you yell and swear and kick a tire and break your toe. But if you can capture that within about five seconds, your rational brain can come online. You can maintain, you know, the character that you want to be, and you can get busy solving the problem. Because I had a place to be. Um, and so I kind of saw this like a little bit of a challenge from the Stoic gods, if you will, that I was being challenged to, um, you know, either break a toe, kick in a tire, or hurry up and solve the problem and get back to where my family needs me. And, you know, I, because I listened to the podcast, like I say, I don't think I would have responded so well uh, in every occasion. But because I listened to the podcast, I saw it as a, as a fun challenge. Got on the phone called the uh, tow truck company, and as it happened, I was far away from tow truck land, and as it happened, there was a tow truck driving by, and he was there in five minutes. Yeah, it cost me 80 bucks, which stung, but uh, but I was on the road pretty quickly. And and that was uh, a really, uh, you know, an amazing stoic insight, and one around maybe some uncomfortable truths, and stoic insights help us around uncomfortable truths. And there's some things happening with COVID that are uncomfortable, but they're, they're true. We can't avoid them. Um, and, and to use a raw example of, of those uncomfortable truths, which our society doesn't really prepare us for, our, our, our society makes us phobic about these uncomfortable truths. So when they show up, it throws us and, and we're kind of unearthed and we're not very capable of managing them. But I, I think this stoic look at um, these uncomfortable truths, uh, and COVID is one of them, kind of helps us find some hope in these situations. Okay, COVID. The world is upside down. We're all adapting as best we can, um, you know, with our businesses, uh, with our jobs, with our shopping, with our uh, uh, parenting, with our teaching. Like I didn't sign up to be a teacher here, and then all of a sudden we're we're we're, we're teaching, and and so the world's upside down, and we're doing the best we can uh, with what we've got, and and this is a good thing. This is resilience, um, and really what we need during this time, I think, is hope. And as a preamble around hope, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, but you kind of need three things to give you hope, and. 
Um, number one, you need a set of values, a, a set of personal values to live by. So if you've never considered those as a family, I think that, you know, COVID uh, provides a lovely opportunity to talk as a family about what your values are. And, and, and I think for kids, it's about respecting kids and seeing them as people and involving them in the, the development of those values. So for instance, so we'll talk about this a little bit later about routines that we create. I think it's important to involve kids with what those routines look like. COVID for kids has caused a profound amount of dysregulation. So it's our job as parents, I firmly believe, to, to, to create a structure around them where they can regulate their nervous systems. There's really two things, I'm getting off track with my hopes, but I'll get back to that. Uh, but there's really two things that help the nervous system regulate. And number one, and that, that's creating a sense of safety for kids. So making them feel safe. And now that's hard when they're listening to the media or hearing parents talk about, is this gonna be okay? Um, and the second thing nervous little kid nervous systems need uh, is they need to feel worthy of love and belonging. So that's our job, that's it, two things. Make them feel safe, make them feel, feel worthy of love and belonging. And, and that's, that's your job as a parent. So back to creating hope. So two things, we, three things we need to create hope. Number one is values. And your homework tonight is to really think about what those values are as an individual, how you parent, and as a family, how you parent. Second thing that gives us hope is having purpose and meaning. So really carving out things that give us purpose and meaning in our life. And those things really, you know, our kids are often an example of that. Um, but when things that define our identity are taken away from us, like the ability to go for a mountain bike ride or a ski or um, whatever it is, I've been really encouraging people um, to uh, come up with other ways to define yourself. So like hobbies, <laughs> not, you know, we see posts about baking bread and gardening and um, you know, cleaning up the crawl space or whatever it is you're doing. Um, and I think those things are really important as we broaden the things that give us purpose and meaning in our life. Um, and I think what, and I think we can all agree that there's a number of positives that come from COVID. There's some really potent negatives that I know many of you are feeling, um, uh, and I'm feeling it right beside you, but I, I, I want you to think about the positives that come uh, from this. And one of them is that, that, that you guys can, uh, or we can all reset our values around the purpose and meaning being our family and what we uh, garner and create together as a family. I think there's a real opportunity. The third thing that gives us hope, so we got values, we got purpose and meaning. The third thing that gives us hope in the midst of a bunch of chaos is community and connecting with your community. And I know that's changed with COVID. I know that's changing. Um, and that's why we have to be innovative. That's why I tip the hat to Whistler Live for doing things like this so we can connect with our people. Um, and, and I think we're finding all kinds of new ways to do this through different platforms. And, and I, I think we really have to find our community right now. Um, all right. So, uh, COVID, this is not a sprint. We can't sprint our way through this one, my friends. I wish we could. And, and you know, the warrior in me kind of wants to do that a little bit, but it's not a sprint, this is a marathon. So we gotta, we can't be really, um, we have to be mindful of the outcome, but we need to be really involved with the process of managing our kids' little nervous systems right now. And so I think one of the, there's a couple of themes that jump out at me when I think of what things are affecting youth uh, and children with COVID. And, and, and number one, anxiety, right? Your kids are going to feel anxiety about this. And, and that is profoundly normal. It's their body's normal way of regulating its little nervous system. Um, hot tip, you're going to feel some anxiety too. Um, hands up in the room, all three in here, who feels anxiety right now? Yeah, I do too. And But the thing about anxiety is we can handle it we can handle this anxiety. We are built for this. And, and this is our opportunity. I really believe that crisis, um, you know, breeds resiliency. And so it's up to us to decide how we're going to show up throughout this to, to manage it. And so anxiety, the thing about anxiety is, again, it's your body's normal reaction to abnormal events. Okay. So, um, and that, that's really, um, 
important for you to model for, for your kids. Um, it's also really important for you to not be judgmental when certain behaviors are coming up um, because those behaviors are likely indicative of the anxiety that's working in the background. It's an it's a indicator that your, your child needs something from you. Right now, my little guy, he might be watching, he likes to wrestle all the time, and, um, but it's constant. It's, Dad, can we wrestle? Dad, can we wrestle? And I love re wrestling my little guy, but there's also other things I got to do, and I can't wrestle all the darn time. But I kind of, it was a twig to me that I, where I realized he needs something more than the wrestling. And it's because, well, for him, I think it was physical discharge around the anxiety about this stuff. And so rather than wrestling, I've been trying to find other ways to discharge that besides physical, right? Like emotional. And I know we've had a couple questions come in already about how we draw some of those uh, responses out of our kids. And we'll get to that perhaps a little bit later. But anxiety is a big piece of what you're going to see in your kid's nervous system with an event like COVID. Um, the thing about anxiety, you're going to see it in the body before you see it. Uh, act, acting out in, in behaviors. So your hot tip on that as a parent is to be really a detective around what you notice going on in your, in your child's nervous system in terms of um, discharging energy, in terms of self-regulating, um, in terms of, um, you know, might even be blatantly asking questions about stuff. And I've had one of those questions uh, from our son uh, which was quite pointed and uh, confronting. And, and the question was this, is everything going to be okay, Dad? Whew, that was one of those moments where I got stopped in my tracks. And, um, and the answer is yes, everything's going to be all right. It's not going to be uh, without tragedy. It's not going to be without a bunch of in inconvenience, but everything is going to be okay. And, and the reason why I know that is, is all systems sort of follow a very, and all chaos follows a very predictable pathway of, you know, sort of rise to greatness, plateau where the greatness has been enjoyed, but then a very predictable um, decline. And sometimes that decline is rapid and smacks us in the face, and sometimes that decline is a bit of a slow burn. Uh, but with that decline comes, unfortunately, a crash, burn, fiery, uh, death. And sometimes that death is literal uh, because we die. That's one of those uh, uncomfortable truths. But it's also quite normal. When we've been raised in a death phobic society, it's hard to swallow that pill. Meanwhile, it's just as normal as being born. So uh, once, once we kind of shift that cultural look that we have on that phobia around those uncomfortable truths, we can learn to accept our ability to pivot and adapt and look for the rebirth. Because that's what that cycle uh, is followed by every single time is this rebirth. So, um, so when my kid asked me this question, is everything going to be okay, dad? The answer is yes. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not without its chaos and tragedy and, and implications that are really hard, first of all, for kids to understand, or parents, let alone to understand, let alone kids, right? So, um, so the answer to that question is yes. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, anxiety and fear in a bit, just kind of hitting some wave caps of what your kids are probably feeling. Another thing your kids are likely feeling a, a great deal of is, is grief, um, but not the typical kind of grief where it's kind of a slap in the face, shocking grief experience. It's more of that slow burn grief as we all try to understand what's happening and what the pro provincial health authority tells us we can and cannot do. And, and, um, it's an iron, it's a, it's a, well, I guess it's just part of what I do in my world, but, but I quite like working with grief. Grief's quite an amazing thing to, to work with, with people because in particular, because I like holding space with people dealing with the implications of that grief and, and, in, and kids, kids, kids are pretty neat dealing with grief as well. And the other thing about grief is it, is it always comes with some rebirth, some version of life enhancement. So um, I like to help navigate people towards that life enhancement. But grief kind of has three, there's lots of models on grief. So you, you might think, oh, Greg, you're wrong. There's other models. And yes, there are. But I like this one for kids. There's sort of three kind of models for kids. There's this sort of disorganization phase, which is really what's happening right now because we're all kind of disorganized, especially with the whole return to school without knowing what school is going to look like, that's, it, it feels disorganized, not because of the district or the teachers or anything like that, because we know they're doing the best they can with what they've got. Um, 
but I have a commentary on that relative to routines a little bit later, I must remember. Uh, maybe Andrew, you could help me remember that, routines, teachers. Um, but 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 this it's uncontrollable this disorganization and so when when we feel that it sort of disables the nervous system a little bit then once we take care of ourselves make ourselves feel safe make ourselves feel worthy of love and belonging we we enter a transition phase and the transition phase is not about outcomes it's about a process it's about a process of understanding what this new norm is going to look like for now until it changes again um, and, and once we process all those things and improve our skill sets around how we're going to do um, manage the grief, how we're going to transition through school, how we're going to transition with seeing our family, how we're going to transition around grief and loss because we can't go see grandma and grandpa, um, all that kind of stuff, then we get into a phase of reorganization. This is when the nervous system reorients. This is when it feels quite capable of self-protection, being able to healthfully fight healthfully flee and healthfully freeze without getting stuck in those, um, those orientations. Um, and we will do this through COVID. Um, and, and really what we're trying to reestablish with this reorganization is a sense of um, safety and worthiness. So again, that's, that's your job as a parent is to reinforce, re reinforce this concept of safety and worthiness. Okay, how do children uh, express grief and loss? I mean, it's, it's, it's varied um, and it's complex, but it could be things for if your kids are younger around bedwetting or some thumb sucking or being more clingy or having difficulty falling asleep or biting their nails or crying or temper tantrums. To the older kids, um, I think one of the big examples Andrew and I were talking about earlier with respect to the older kids is and this, there's some ironies here, right? Many of you have been um, working really hard to uh, delay exposure to too much screen time, and now we're telling kids to get on the screens and do school and FaceTime their friends, right? So there's these funny little ironies out there. Uh, but I think for older kids, I think one of the things we're seeing is a deep dive into profound numbing with screens. And, um, and I think that was maybe happening a little bit before this. And, but I think us as adults, we need to accept that these things aren't really going anywhere. Um, but we really need to maintain a sense of authority as a parent around what the normative behavior with those family values, remember those values that give you hope, uh, what the normative behavior around those family values are going to be, okay? And when you involve your kids in creating the household routine, because you will, you'll involve your kids, you're going to allow them lots of uh, choice to include screens in that day but with boundaries, okay? So we'll talk about that a little bit more. And so, so I think with older kids, I think one of the things we're seeing is profound numbing. Um, and that's a form of managing grief, right? Because I don't want to deal with that thing over there, so I'm going to just uh, check out how many likes I have on Instagram. Uh, and, and I think those of us as adults can perhaps relate to that too because we have our ways of numbing too, don't we? Uh, and it's not just drugs and alcohol, right? It could be Netflix. Uh, I know I did a deep dive into some dysfunctional stuff recently. <laughs> Tiger King, anyone watch that? Yes. Uh, that's, I don't know if that's uh, making me smarter or not, but one thing it did do is distract me for a little while. Um, and maybe that's okay. But the problem is when we are getting into profound, profound numbing and, and uh, you know, and Netflix feeds it to you, don't they? Like that little screen comes up. The next episode starts in three, two, one. So they're just spoon feeding it to you. And so we have to be the ones that are in control of that. Okay. There's a question right here. I have a question. Yeah, the question me. just came in. Our first question. Craig, in, in relation to what you're talking about, he said, uh, I find my kids are often disassociated. Mm -hmm. What do you recommend for getting them to engage in a conversation about coronavirus and what's going on in the world? Okay, great question. So what do I do to engage kids who may be dissociated on conversations around coronavirus? Great question. And well, I could, I could think I could talk at length about that. But I think some, some broad strokes would be, you don't want to hide kids from the truth. You want to tell them what's going on. But that doesn't mean you need to expose them to all of the ooey gooey details. Depending on how old your kids are, I've actually I know some people in town uh, with a high school age kid who are actually quite involving him in the graphs and in the science behind why um, social isolation is going to flatten the curve. And, and uh, with a bit of probing, you know, as you able to determine that the kid wasn't triggered by this knowledge, he was quite stimulated by it. 
So I think as a parent, you could feed that stimulation um, a bit to a degree. I don't think you need to overstimulate it. I don't. I know personally, I cannot overstimulate myself with the news feeds. I really have to work hard to protect myself from that. I choose personally to have only one soundbite a day around COVID news. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that has to involve what's happening in my professional governing body. And that has to involve something, some stuff that's happening to keep the, the family safe and the household safe. And, and I might, um, uh, I do watch the prime minister's uh, address each day uh, because I find if I, if I go too far beyond that, um, you know, it's, it's too triggering myself. Um, sorry, back to that question a little bit around engaging them. Um, you know, I think checking in with the age of your kids, if, if they're showing interest and, and they're seemingly not triggered by the content, give them a taste, engage them, especially around uh, uh, things that are um, socially relevant in our, in our media relative to socialization, relative to school, relative to, shop, to shopping, right? And, and so uh, as the kids get a bit younger, personally, I, I would protect them from that to a degree. Uh, however, the bottom line is, is uh, you tell them, uh, but with some boundaries. You were, you were just speaking about grief mm -hmm. and prior to the question. And uh, grief, uh, very much in relation, we have a question about loss, our children's loss of normalcy and uh, the loss of their friends. Mm -hmm. the normal routines mm -hmm. so that was another question that we had mm -hmm. it's particular. yeah and that's real um and and that cannot be denied so i think as parents we need to honor and acknowledge that loss as a real thing and i think we need to um i don't know provide them other alternatives to socialize and i know i know i for one i think we all have been I, for one, have been on a learning curve about what that looks like. Two weeks ago, I was inviting uh, my kids' friends to play maybe street hockey together, thinking that the sticks offered this perfect uh, social distancing um, tool. Um, but now um, I, I wouldn't do that. Um, and, and, and so, um, you know, I think we're all evolving around, around how we manage that. But, um, you know, and I, I'm thinking on my feet with a lot of these answers, you guys, but I think, um, you know, tonight my kid did a FaceTime uh, call with five of his friends. So there they are, you know, all the images and, and they're talking about their day. I think the school has done a particularly good job on this and using technology. Um, our, our kids teacher, Chris Williamson, um, using Google Hang or Google, I don't know the name of it. It's one of the Google platforms that offers, um, um, you know, live kid interaction around content that the teacher provides. And, uh, and I just, you know, I've just, it's warmed my heart seeing that evolution. And like I said at the start, this is going to be a core competency that we're all trying to adapt to. And it's things like this, perhaps, that's going to help our kids adapt to it like this, because... Um, it's just what they've what they've known, right? So I think we have to find alternative ways to find uh, that that human interaction and that human connection. Recently, our family did a uh, trivia night uh, with I think there was eleven family members on a Zoom platform. Again, another one of these uh, uh, platforms to to communicate, and it was a good fun evening. Uh, I know some uh, people who. Uh, um, I'm getting some texts here from some friends that may be watching. So yes, you Tiger King fans. Um, um, I know of some some people who had a uh, a good laugh and a social with um, their girlfriends over a glass of wine in their wedding dresses, and and they were just having a riot. So it's pretty neat to witness some of these things and the way uh, the way it evolves, but. Um, yeah, loss. It's real. Um, oh, we're getting another question is in here. The, uh, the, the someone sent you a text saying it was Google Classroom is what they're using ah, right now. Thank you, Google Classroom, um, and it's it's working uh, quite well so far in, in my own kids' classroom. Yeah. And there was a question here that was followed up from Dan, and Dan was saying, and I think you've covered this a little bit in, in what you've just said. Sure. How to calm and engage the rational mind. Right. Exercises. Yeah. Yeah, exercises to calm and engage, engage the rational mind. So there's kind of two parts to the mind, right? There's this emotion mind, and then there's this rational mind. And, and I think we have a hard time as humans, as the, at the best of times, as adults, 
at choosing which brain function to be in and when appropriately so. Um, and so, um, you know, imagine how difficult it is for kids. A couple of the exercises I really believe in, one is um, getting kids in the here and now, the present moment. And I think as a prelude to some of this, some kids really require a lot of physical discharge. So kids who get physical discharge, movement, um, and I, I wouldn't say all kids, but I would say a lot to most. And, you know, you educators out there, you can disagree with me. Uh, but I think once kids have the opportunity to get some primal urge to move their body out of their nervous system, it makes it easier to um, access that rational brain. Okay. Um, I think here and now exercises that get the nervous system in the present moment are really good uh, at, at achieving that. And so, you know, and there's some apps out there that I've been curious about and referring people to, you know, the call app and the headspace app. And there's some really neat things. One I, one I uh, stumbled upon, thanks to my perfect partner, uh, was some, I don't even know what it's called, but I think it was headspace where they were reading you a short story. And it was like Matthew McConaughey or something reading you a story, um, you know, this nice flowing voice. And the story was about a bear. Uh, but it was just so relaxing to have that sense of hearing um, stimulated uh, where we could be distracted um, and, and, and right away you could see like our kids' nervous system just settle, my own, my own included. Um, so connecting with your sense of touch, sense of taste, sense of smell, sense of hearing, and sense of sight attunes the nervous system to what's real. And what's real, as we've covered, is that they're safe and that they're worthy of love and belonging. So sometimes I'll do that where I'll say, you know, to my kid, cold day maybe, let's stick our head in the river or um, let's take a bite of this pine needle, you know, or um, hey, notice the smell of the cedar pollen because it's spring. When you attune kids to those, uh, those things, um, I think you're able to access that rational brain a little bit. I also think that Spring, um, the time of year, offers us a really nice archetype or uh, system um, to connect with right now. And if you attune your kids to that system, uh, I think it highlights a couple of really important things. Number one, that everything's going to be okay because everything's happening in nature just like it always does this time of year. So really taking a minute to notice the buds popping up, to notice the crocuses. To um, and and in our household, we've been trying to integrate that into some of the school-based learning, right? The project-based learning, um, and 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 so so yeah. I for one have found that connecting with that archetype of spring has been profoundly settling for my own nervous system because it reminds me everything's gonna rebound and be okay. And then when I connect with that, it really does pick me up a little bit. Sounds like there's some more questions coming in there, Andrew. There was a question about. Uh, Someone was saying having some difficulty, and I think this—I think this is in reference to routines as well. And in, mm -hmm. in these challenging times, getting kids to go to bed mm -hmm. and and having difficulty with with the, with the, with that fear possibly mm -hmm. entering into that. So, do you have any comments about uh, routines? Well, let's talk about routines a little bit. Um, and there was a question about routines that came in from a friend as well, and. Um, I think routines are profoundly important because we're in this disorganization phase around grief and loss. We as parents, it's our job to create those routines for the kids. And Matthew, who's in the background on the tech side of this, I did provide him with a link or a image. I'm not sure, Matthew, how you'll manage this, but of the, um, of the uh, routine that we've created in our own household, we've, that's the Royal Weave, my perfect partner created it. And, um, and uh, uh, feel free to use it. Um, and it's not perfect. Um, it's not, you know, uh, militantly adhered to each day. Um, but it's, it's our best step at creating some routine and structure around what's expected uh, in our, from all of us in the household. Now, we involved our kid in that. Um, you know, he's 10. Um, we wanted him to have a voice in what that looked like. Uh, where he was really wanting to involve tech. And so much to my, I got to be like dragged into that a little bit, but I really want him to have some ownership over what this looks like. And I want him to be self-directed and care about what he's learning 
rather than maybe some of the way we, we were ways we were taught. Um, and so, and so, uh, routines are profoundly important because what it does for the nervous system, it helps it reorientate. It kids desire structure. Kids need us and rely on us as parents um, to create that structure for them. Um, and, and so, you know, some things to consider. Uh, when do you get your physical discharge as a family? I know for us, we do it right at 7, 7.30 when we get up. Just a little 15, 20 minutes of body movement. Uh, we're going for a run and doing some uh, YouTube uh, workouts. It's been pretty fun. Um, we're, uh, I think we've all been uh, trying to manage our food a little bit. Um, and not over consuming another way we can numb um, but but what are we going to eat and how do we create and craft that and and uh, and do it together as a family when what what's school going to look like what are our household expectations and chores um, this is a big one around self-care and grooming I don't know about you but um, when I when I didn't have to go out there I was kind of like there was a couple days I was in my duck dynasty pjs for one day too long and uh, uh, so I told myself a few days ago that I was going to take a shower and put a button on and have a shave and, and put a button down shirt on before my phone client, like the phone client would know I was in my duck dynasty PJs, probably not. But, uh, but I thought if I decide that I'm going to show up, um, you know, groomed, um, you know, that has an effect on who I show up as psychologically and who I am going to be in front of my client. Now there's a Chinese, uh, uh, philosophy around um, getting up in the morning, the first thing you should do is make your bed. Because the thing with this uh, Chinese philosophy is that it accepts that there's chaos in the world. But if you make your bed as the first action that you do, the moment you step out of bed, that it's a profound symbol of what intention you bring around creating rebirth in the rest of the day. Okay, so that's a routine you can bring in for kids. Um, uh, around making the bed and, uh, and those household expectations uh, and chores. And so I highly recommend you guys work as a family to create a little schedule of what that looks like. Okay. Was, was there any more with that? No, I think that was good. And, and you wrapped it up with the screen time because mm -hmm. I know that that's a concern in my household. Mm -hmm. How much is too much? How much is not enough? But right now we rely on it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But I think as parents, we want to know what they're consuming. Um, and, and how they're consuming it, um, and, and how much they're consuming and, you know, you know, yeah. And I, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to take a hard line of what the time should look like for each age group. But, um, you know, I think a, a little chunk in the morning, um, and I know like in our kids grade five, you know, there's two hours where they could be online with respect to school and that's great. Um, and, um, but maybe it's less and maybe a little chunk at night. Um, but if the other thing is, if, if it's another screen, like let's say a movie, I think one of the best ways to manage that at night is to make it like a family movie. Um, and, and so you're watching it together, you're interrelating together, and maybe it's a movie about, um, uh, about hope in some way. And I don't want to sound Pollyanna-ish around that, but, but, it, but inspiring movies that pick people up um, not trigger them before they go back to bed. Okay, we have a, a question here from uh, Amy. Hi, mm -hmm. Amy. Uh, it's just thank you, thank you, Greg. How would you address the anticipated longevity of our new normal when talking to a teenager? Mm -hmm. Talk of end of summer is a lifetime for a teenager when missing their friends and sports routines. It's true. Online platforms may help for the short term. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't got the rest of that question. Right there, but, uh, I got the gist and great question, Amy. And I think there's one word in there that jumps out at me and the word is anticipation. When we anticipate anything, the Stoics would say that that's a big precursor to anxiety because, um, or in, in my language, it's sort of anticipatory loss. When you're anticipating how bad something can be, it can be quite triggering for the nervous system. So for teenagers, I think, you want to be able to manage the narrative. If the narrative is distorted and really negative, that's going to affect your, um, you know, it's going to affect you psychologically in terms of who you show up as, but it's also going to affect you 
in terms of brain science because the neural pathways in your brain just get sort of over myelinated with all this bad stuff and then our, our thoughts get stuck in a rut. And so that's the brain science behind that. So we want, that's the bad news, but the good news with the brain is that they're, the brain is plastic. So we've got this concept, which is only about 10 years old called neuroplasticity. If we come up with a new way of thinking, new neural pathways get myelinated and that becomes our reality. So I think it's about inviting them into, um, um, you know, an opportunistic way of thinking as opposed to a, um, um, distorted way of thinking. And uh, the other thing is, 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 is how we frame things. Now, Amy, check that podcast out that I mentioned earlier. So the podcast title is called The Happiness Lab. Grab your pens. It's The Happiness Lab. And um, uh, Dr. Lori Santos had an interview with Bill Irvine, and he talks about this in depth of how we create a frame and think of a frame like a, a construction frame like we construct a thought and with that thought it kind of leads us into a belief system and, and very much so that belief system can trigger our anxiety and so we want to help them create a reframe another way of looking at that the story is just something that we create um, and we have some ownership over what that story looks like if it's doom and gloom um, then that's going to affect us so and i think kids need help um, with that rational brain um, uh, being kind of evoked with what that story is, right? I hope that makes sense. You wanted to sound excellent. Mm -hmm. You wanted to be reminded to go back to a few points on grief. I think you asked me to remind you of that. I don't know if you wanted to go back there or just move forward. Grief. Um, oh, yeah. Well, we were talking about anticipatory loss, and that's a point connected to um, grief. And and, and so um, when we're anticipating that loss, it can trigger anxiety. So I think we just want to try to be in the here and now and do the best we can with what we've got and, and really have a ton of gratitude for, for what we do have around us. And that's hard as parents sometimes when we're doing our best to pivot when the nature of our jobs have changed or the nature of our income has changed. Um, but but is, but is having, having that gratitude, um, it really does um, yeah, change your mood a little bit, I think, there. Um, a couple other uh, concepts that I wanted to kind of talk about, um, and uh, number one was around, how are we doing for time here? You're doing good. Well, you're, you're at about, uh, right now we're at about 40 minutes. Okay. Um, okay, well, well, we'll start to, 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 to wind down here and then get to those last remaining questions, but, but I think a couple key takeaways, you want to normalize anxiety you want to normalize the grief that comes with um you know experiencing unknowns like COVID. um you want to uh, create routines to settle that nervous system down um, you want to provide them lots of structure and opportunities to discharge the yayas that, that they have um, you want to reinforce that everything's going to be okay again because we all you don't have to agree with me on this but there's this sort of um symbolic flow to how everything works uh right this birth rise to greatness plateau where the greatness is enjoyed slow decline crash burn fiery death and again sometimes that death is literal sometimes it's figurative but what follows that in every occasion is this rebirth so once once kids get towards that uh reorganization uh phase of grief and loss then then we can start to really um, take a look at what that rebirth looks like um, and, and again, I talked about archetypes earlier and that symbolic connection that um, um, spring um, kind of gives us. Uh, it really does connect us to the rhythm of things, and this is a profound reminder of the cyclical nature of things, and the rebirth will occur at some point. So connecting your kids with that in some way, and perhaps that becomes part of your new purpose and meaning, I think is really useful. I want to really highlight the power uh, of relationships right now. I mean, the power of relationships are coming into stark relief, um, and, and it's true at schools. Uh, those relationships are key to learning and that doesn't change at home and I think a lot of parents out there are having their own parent anxiety about okay great now I have to be a teacher too and I would say that's your second job your first job is to be a parent your kids are going to be okay through this um, 
And I've had a couple long talks with some other educators out there and school-based psychologists around, you know, what what what's a timeline that a kid needs to do at school? And, and you know, again, there's going to be people that are going to disagree with me out there, and I'm okay with that. You can crucify me if you wish. But, uh, but you know, if your kids are doing an hour, hour and a half of school work each day, personally, I think that's okay. Um, and I think it could be scattered throughout the day based on your family schedule. Um, but I think those relationships, um, because maybe they're not happening so much at school, they have to be highlighted at home a little bit. Um, so your number one job is not the teacher part. Your number one job is to be that parent. And, and in parenting, we create a sense of safety and a sense of worthiness. That's it. So with kids, stay really attuned to their needs. Um, shift any judgments that you might have about them for curiosity. Be curious about what's going on behind uh, the scenes. So if they're biting their nails or... Um, my kid asking me to wrestle all the time. Be curious about that uh, as opposed to, to judgmental. Sometimes in the teaching world, we say be curious, not furious, because um, that curiosity breeds human connection. That curiosity breeds, breeds empathy and compassion for what they're experiencing. Um, when you see kids acting out, all behavior is communication. So they can't all, all the time tell us with words what's going on in their emotion brain. So it's, it's you being that inquisitive parent, that curious parent to try to get behind um, uh, to find out what's, what's kind of going on for them. Uh, also remember that your kids are doing the best they can with what they've got. They want to please you and you as a parent are a profound model for what that looks like. So really choosing who you're going to show up with, uh, show up as in the morning after you make your bed, right? Really setting the intention to be attuned and connected, um, giving time for the kids, but also giving time for you and your work and your self-care and, and your, your relationship connection. I think some of the implicate many implications with grief and loss, or, or sorry, with COVID that we're not going to talk about tonight, we just can't get to, but some of them are involved things like, uh, you know, you can't travel to see an aging or dying parent or, or, or high conflict separations. And there are Lots of uh, resources out there, including one at the House Sound Women's Center, uh, the Peace Program, the Peace Counseling Program, and uh, Sheila Shurkat runs there, runs that there. So, um, you know, it, 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 connecting with those resources that are out there, and I think Matthew will drop some of those resources down. And and, and I'm I'm but one resource, and we're not going to be exhaustive with the resources that get dropped. Uh, but there's a few of them out there as well as others. Looks like there's a question coming in. Well, just a point uh, from uh, Chelsea. She said, Whistler Adaptive is hosting online programs for children and youth who are neurodiverse. Awesome. And, uh, and or have a cognitive disability. So contact uh, Whistler Adaptive uh, if you have kids who need to connect with our community and coaches. Excellent. Great addition, Chelsea. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I was saying kids are doing the best they can with what they've got, right? And I know you guys are as parents, so give yourself a break. Um, try to shed that super woman, super man veil that you have to take all this away for your kids. In fact, that's the wrong approach from that stoic perspective because um, that's, that's that uncomfortable truth that we're not kind of willing to sometimes approach with kids. But I think we have to. We have to normalize those things so we're not phobic about all the stuff that's going on with them. Um, take time for yourself. I think, you know, I always go back to that old oxygen mask analogy um, around, uh, you know, what do, they, what do you do on the plane when it comes down? Well, you put it on you first because you're no good to your kids beside you unless you can breathe yourself. Um, and I know I've had to work with my partner on crafting how I do that and how she does that for herself because we're off kilter on that right now. It's affecting me a little bit and I'm squirrely, um, but, but we're talking about it. And I think that's um, what, what you want to do. And so for you partners out there, I think you want to be gentle with each other. I think you want to be influenced by one another. I think you want to um, be fond of one another. Um, I think you want, and if you're not fond of one another, you know, Esther Perel, you may have heard of her. She's quite famous in the, in the relationship world. She has a recent 
uh, podcast about um, um, the quarantine in relationships. And, and so I haven't actually uh, listened to it yet, but I just saw it today and I want to check that out because it's not easy sometimes being all cooped up. Um, what else do you want to be with your partners? You want to um, make bid attempts to connect with your partner and you also want to receive bid attempts um, and repair attempts. Um, and I think that's, that's an important thing to take on. In order to take care of yourself, I think you really have to acknowledge and know what uh, you have on your plate, how much you have on your plate and, and being able to um, um, you know, take on what you can and what you can't. Um, I think sort of lastly, just on those sort of wave cap things that I wanted to communicate was I really invite you to spark discussion in your family uh, about how you're going to conduct yourself, who you're going to show up as, and, and how, how you're going to conduct yourself in front of each other. And again, I think I said it earlier, but crisis kind of breeds this um, adaptation and resilience, and, and uh, I'm certain that we can all do it while we hunt for the rebirth. Um, Andrew, were you going to uh, yeah, I'll come back. I'll come back in. and join yeah. me here for a minute? I'm going to come back and join you. Okay, and, uh, do. For, everyone, for everyone sitting at home, uh, you can join me in, in, in thanking Greg uh, for being with us today. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, as a father of four kids, uh, a 10-year-old, a 15-year-old, a 17-year-old, um, I was listening to a lot of what you were saying, and I thought to myself, I'm failing miserably. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the club. I feel that all the time. Yeah. That's part of the vulnerability. And, and again, I know a thing or two about this, but I'm also closing my eyes and jumping sometimes. Yeah. So we're all doing the best we can with what we've got. I think a lot of the questions that we were getting from you guys at home surrounded, a lot of the, a lot of the concerns and questions surrounded the older teenagers, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. being the most difficult. Uh, uh, one one person was mentioning that their 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 child is online. That's mm -hmm. their social network. Mm -hmm. the, the the gaming, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm sure that uh, you know we talked a bit about it yeah. before before the show about the almost the addiction. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I think we as adults have to accept that that is a form of socialization, and it's really adapting before our eyes, and it's unlike anything we've ever known with what respect with respect to what socialization looks like. So. Um, but, but, but definitely be curious about that with your kid, not judgmental about it. Cause if, if they shut down because they perceive that judgment, they're going to go into the closet with it. And now, so be curious, uh, rather than judgmental. So you can talk about how it works, uh, follow them online, um, comment with them, join them and play that video game, uh, with their friends and, um, and, and listen, you know, and then be part of the conversation. Yeah. It's a bit of a safety net for a lot of kids totally. right now. Totally. Definitely. Definitely. Can you just explain what bid attempts is? Great question. So bid attempts, uh, that, so that's relationship um, uh, language around uh, connecting. And so, uh, and so you can think of it with respect to your partner, but you can also think of it, of it with respect to your kids. And, and your kids, you doing it to your kids and your kids doing it to you. So bids are attempts to connect with somebody. Okay, so I said earlier, you want to be able to make bid attempts and receive bid attempts. So if I was making a bid attempt, I might say, hey, would you like to go for sushi, right? And, and so if you get that bid, then, you know, you want to do one of three, th you want to do, there's three things you could do with that bid. You could turn toward that bid. Yes, Greg, let's go for sushi, hopefully one day. Um, you could turn away from that bid or you could turn against the bid. So generally speaking, when we're looking at family interaction and the family system interaction, we want to turn toward those bids. So if your kid's making a bid with you and at the 10th time they've asked you to wrestle, um, turn toward that bid and I guess you're wrestling or you're connecting in another way because you've wrestled four times already today. Right? So maybe it's let's go outside and play hockey or let's actually do a three digit uh, division question here. Uh, whatever, whatever it looks like, or let's build something together because I thought that building offers uh, an opportunity to discharge those yayas, an, an opportunity to um, connect that rational brain, and now you're side by each doing something together. So you've turned toward the bid. If you want to know anything more about bids, check out John Gottman, all things John Gottman. I know that my wife is watching this right now, mm -hmm. and, uh, and she's saying, I really hope honey, that you're listening to this man. 
<laughs> because you know she's the, the vivid attempts, the the uh, you know interacting with your children and 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 uh, in the, in these difficult times, it's a uh, it's it's important to do so. By the way, it's my wife's birthday today. I have to send a shout out to her. Oh, that's nice. But I think what you just said, Andrew, is is a bid. Yeah. So very nice work. Well, you know, I yeah. I was thinking about a bid. If I go home and I and I uh, do the dishes for my wife. Mm -hmm. There's a, I'm communicating with her, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. sure. uh, and that's an important, that's, that's an important thing. Um, I, I, I tell you what, I'm so grateful to uh, have Greg here. Um, also, I'm very grateful. I just saved $140 in therapy right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many times Dr. Tom DeMarco has said, you need to go talk to Greg. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you know what? It's been a pleasure meeting you. And uh, on behalf of the Whistler community, uh, the Whistler Secondary School, the parents at, at uh, Myrtle Phillips and Spring Creek. I know that we all appreciate you taking the time out for, mm -hmm. from uh, everything that you've got going on mm -hmm. to, to, to share with us. So, I mean, on behalf of Whistler Live and, uh, and all the parents out there, mm -hmm. I know that we both, uh, we, we, we all collectively mm -hmm. appreciate this. It's all about community, isn't it, right, right now? Mm -hmm. Very much so. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm honored to be here with thanks to the um, school district. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that I'm but one resource. The community is full of a number of amazing resources, other therapists that you can access, um, lovely and wonderful and very skilled teachers and, and, and school-based counselors um, and, uh, and community services that are available in our community. So we're quite lucky. To be here, and I'm just one of those resources. And and I, you know, we've covered some wave caps tonight, um, without really a deep dive into them. But yeah, it's been a, a bit of a far ranging conversation. So, yeah. so thanks for having me. And I and I guess it's uh, most importantly, if you're having any difficulties mm -hmm. to reach out mm -hmm. in any way, shape, or form, reach out mm -hmm. to your neighbor, reach out to your friends. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all have to come together during this mm -hmm. this. Uh, unprecedented times and I, I, I feel a sense of community mm -hmm. um, and I feel a sense of a, a different sense of, 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 of closeness with my friends despite the fact that we're so far apart mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because we're all we're all in this together I, I'm gonna leave I'm gonna close out uh, today's talk with a quote that I read on your your site and I, it, it was uh, I thought it was very poignant and very pr perfect for the times it said the sickness may spread but so does the cure because hope is contagious Hope is what saves the world. Mm -hmm. so That's we, it. Hope. We all, we all need a little hope. Mm -hmm. That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to Whistler Live. We appreciate having you here. And uh, a nice round of applause for Mr. Greg McDonough. Thank you very much for being here. And for Whistler Live. Thank you. We're, we're, we're honored, honored, and uh, proud to be a part of it. Good night, everybody. Have a great night.